I, uh, I gave some thought to what I would talk about, um, an idea that I think has been at the heart of my life and my work. And that idea is really the idea of human rights. And I'm going to talk a little bit about it, but before I do, let me tell you a little bit about my background. I'm a Scot, as you can hear from my accent. I was brought up in Glasgow. I was brought up in a big working class family. And uh, nobody had, in my family had gone to, on to higher education before I did. And my two older sisters had left school at 15. And so I was the one who got this opportunity, encouraged my fire having been lit, in fact by a wonderful teacher at my school, um, who encouraged me to take part in debating. And uh, the first time he asked me to do it, um, he, was my, he taught me classics, Latin and Greek. And uh, he, he was the Latin, he was the classics master. And he, uh, he said to me, um, uh, come in, and we said, we're going to have a debate about the death penalty. And he said, and you, Helena, and I think I was about 12 or 13, you will be in favor of the death penalty, and you, Charlie, and you'll be against the, the, uh, the death penalty. And I put my hand up and I said, I, I don't want to be in favor of the death penalty. I'm, I, I'm not in favor of the death penalty. And of course, as I'd been growing up as a little girl, there, there had been great debates about the death penalty and it was uh, abolished, but there were still always arguments going on in newspapers about how it should be returned. And I didn't like the idea of the death penalty and I said I didn't want to do that. And he said, no, 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 you don't understand about debating. Debating is about putting your feet into the shoes of people who might believe something and therefore making the arguments that they would make. And that's the thing about debating, is that you have to be able to make that shift and to make the argument tell the story as it would be told by somebody who believes this. And so I got into debating, and I got to understand it and like it, and I suppose it did create a little flame that made me eventually just choose to be a lawyer. And I went, I became a, a, a student of law, and uh, and, I was very clear. I didn't want to be a commercial lawyer or a corporate lawyer or a lawyer who was in the business to make lots and lots of money. Um, and I can't pretend that I haven't done well enough. Um, but, uh, but I really wanted to make a difference to people's lives. It was the human connection to law that interested me. And I, uh, I started by being uh, a, a, a lawyer who did as a junior, as a baby barrister. I started by doing all kinds of cases, but they were all of a theme in that they were acting for people who had very little voice in the system. And that's what interested me, was the way in which whole sections of our society, when they were either needed law, because they were forced out of their housing or they had uh, their job, they were dismissed from a job unfairly simply because an employer decided that they didn't need that many staff anymore and didn't even give them a chance to you know, to, to make an argument as to why they, they should be kept on. Um, the way that people were treated in their lives, and often in most dismissively uh, uh, ways, um, those were the things that interested me. And so I acted for employees in those kinds of uh, tribunal cases, making the, the, the case for them. Um, I, would argue, I would argue for people in tenancy agreement cases and where they were living in poor housing. And in the 70s, there were often issues around slum landlords who exploited their tenants. And, uh, and I also did a whole, a whole range of criminal cases. And many of the criminal cases I was doing were representing young people, juveniles, who got themselves into trouble. But it would affect the whole of their lives if they were not well represented and they didn't have their case argued well, because they would be lumbered with convictions. And once that's happened, it's very hard to get your life back together again, because a stamp is put on you. Um, I did cases involving racism, where um, people experienced incredible forms of racism. And and uh, in communities where they faced serious racism. Um, I did cases involving um, the horrible things that used to happen to, to homosexuals, the, the terrible um, uh, ways in which they were often um, at the receiving end of discrimination and, and real hostility and, and really bad policing where they would often um, be very, very ill-treated. And would be brought before courts where um, they would be charged with offences where they would say, you know, I, that, I, I, that, well, that didn't happen. Um, but they didn't want 
their family to know that they were homosexual, and so therefore they would often plead guilty to things that they hadn't done because they felt that they were going to be faced with uh, serious exposure. So the, I started off doing very low-level cases, and although I became, in the end, what was deemed to be a very grand lawyer doing some of the most serious cases in our system, espionage, terrorism, uh, murder trials, um, I didn't start in that way. I started small, and the driving force all the way through has, to, has been about really giving voice to the voiceless. And I've loved my work. And in the same way that I love hearing Hattie talking about how she loves what she does, how it lights her fire, being in the courts lights my fire. And although I've done lots of other things in my life, I've broadcast, I've written books, I've, um, I've I'm now in, in Parliament, and I'm in the, the, the senior part of, you know, the older part of, uh, of, the, of, of our parliamentary system in the House of Lords, and I'm involved, therefore, in laws creation. Um, the thing that I love best is being in the courts, and I love arguing a case, and I love the drama of that, I love the intellectual challenge of that, but I love the sheer humanity of it. I love the connection with people, the stories of people's lives. Um, the ways in which you can affect an outcome which has a huge impact on the lives that, that people lead and in trying to secure justice for them. So my life in the law has been the most fulfilling thing. And when young people come to me saying that they want to be a lawyer, although it's hard and it's competitive and it's difficult to get started, I always encourage them because it's been such a fulfilling thing in my life. Now, I want to tell you a little bit how my life has evolved. I'm now seen as being one of the country's leading lawyers in the field of human rights. And I'm certainly a real champion of, of, of human rights and what they mean. On Monday, I was in Parliament, and we were uh, dealing with what's called the second reading of a bill that was going through Parliament. And in, at that stage, you make speeches about, about why the bill might be important and how it might be improved. And the bill was the modern slavery bill. And I want you to think for a minute about the very idea that here we are living in Britain, in the United Kingdom, in the 21st century, and we are having a slavery bill. What are we thinking about? You know, Wilberforce, you know, and the end of slavery was surely a long time ago. And yet, whole, whole parts of my work in recent years has been dealing with the business of human trafficking. The fact that with globalization and all the, 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 and there have been good things that have come from globalization, undoubtedly, many of the poor in the world have been lifted from poverty because of globalization, but also we've seen huge swathes of, of exploitation. And some of the bad stuff that is the underbelly of the global market is that there are black markets and there's nothing that can't be sold. And I see that in my work, that we've seen a huge growth in trafficking of arms, trafficking of drugs, uh, trafficking of fissile material. Fissile material is what's used in creating um, uh, you know, nuclear bombs. Um, that we see trafficking in um, human organs. Um, I did a case not so long ago which was about the trafficking in human eggs, women's, the eggs taken from women's uh, uterus, you know, taken from their, their, from their uh, ovaries in order to sell them to other, to other places. And of course, it's the women in the developing world and the third world who are usually um, uh, selling uh, their eggs. Um, that we are seeing trafficking in human beings. And sometimes it's for migrant labor, it's to exploit them in the workforce because they will work for very much less if they come from the poorest of countries, even if it's from the poorest parts of, of, of Europe, uh, in our expanded Europe and they'll come and they'll work for very little and they'll live in you know, porter cabins, horrible conditions, without toilets, without proper cooking facilities or where the cooking facilities are so dangerous that often there are fires, where we have people trafficked for domestic servitude. And I recently chaired an inquiry um, that was looking at human trafficking and to one's shock and horror, um, one realized the extent to which there were people in houses big houses in the areas that we all live in, where there are people who are, have their passports taken from them, who sleep on floors, and who work all hours of the day and night, looking after people's babies, cleaning people's houses, doing all kinds of things. 
and the notion is that their families back in Bangladesh or in uh, Philippines or somewhere will be the people who will be paid, but at the rate that is the Filipino rate or the, Pal the Pakistani rate or the for poor folk from rural villages. And, and then the whole business of trafficking for sexual purposes of women and of, of, of children and indeed sometimes of young men. And the horror of that and the fear that people have about in any way divulging who their traffickers, traffickers are. They're so fearful. And often they're persuaded that they're here, that they've been brought, first of all, they're brought sometimes offering them jobs that look like legitimate jobs, that you'll be working for a family, you'll be working in a hotel, that you'll be doing a, a, a job that will pay you enough money to help educate your children back home. And then you become bonded into into the labor, into the, and usually then pressed into prostitution, but because you have a debt and you're threatened that if you don't pay the debt back and the interest on that debt and the interest will be a multiplier where every week we'll see a huge increase in what is owed. And people are in terror because they know that if they in any way speak out, it's going to be their own children back home or their own families or their own mother who will suffer the consequences. And the terror is tangible when you meet with people or you take evidence from them about all of that. What is it that's going on that we should be still in the 21st century having to try to end this kind of crime against other human beings? And I just want to tell you a very brief story about why all this is such an important part of our world and why we have to end it and why we in Britain should not be retreating from human rights and our commitment to human rights because Britain has a sort of moral authority around the world when it comes to these issues, that we stand true on being protective of the humanity of other people, that we have you know, taken a line, that we don't torture people in, 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 uh, uh, when we pull them in for questioning, even when crimes have been committed, that we have to take a, a lead in all of this because we know that the world has places where are tortured endemically, where they, it's just a regular feature of life when people are taken into custody. And so for us to retreat from human rights would be a terrible thing. When the Second World War ended, one of my heroines, Eleanor Roosevelt, had a dinner party. And I always say to people, it's that dinner party that I would have liked to have gone to. It was a dinner party in her flat in Washington Square. And when you all travel to New York, as you will do at some point in your life if you haven't already, there's this fabulous square in Greenwich Village, which is right beside NYU, New York University. And around the square, there are very beautiful townhouses. And she lived in one of them. And she invited to her home in February 1947 lawyers and judges and leading what's called jurists, people who write on law and uh, study law. She invited them to this dinner party. And she said, how do we make sure that we never have another Holocaust, that we never have this kind of mass abuse of people? How do we create a, a world in which the rights of the individual, the humanity of individuals is respected? And the problem was, and why she'd invited lawyers and judges, was because lawyers and judges in Germany had in fact sanctioned and rubber stamped some of the most terrible and egregious and horrible wrongs so that people were sent off to concentration camps with a stamp of judicial authority on them. And so judges had played their part in it. And when those judges were brought for trial, and those lawyers who'd played those parts, what they said was, but we were just administering the law. It was the law that was passed by our government. We were part of the rule of law. And we weren't doing anything wrong. Our master was the law. And the law was created in the parliament of the, of, the, of the government of Hitler. And of course, what Eleanor Roosevelt was saying was, how do we deal with that? That people say, this is the law. That in China, they'll say, this is the law. And we're, having, we're dealing with the law. That in Saudi Arabia, when women who might even go to a, a male gathering can be prosecuted for immoral behavior and face terrible punishment for doing so, what the lawyers and judges would say, this is the law. And so what Eleanor Roosevelt was saying, how do we inject into every legal system 
a set of standards that's somehow respectful of our humanity? And what should those values be? So that whatever the legal system, whether it's the common law system that we have here in Britain, whether it's the civil law system of France or Germany, whether it's constitutional systems of Japan, whether it's the systems of Sharia law in, in uh, um, Islamic nations, whatever the system of law, shouldn't there be a, somehow a template of some things that shouldn't be missing? And that was what the Universal Declaration of Human Rights was about, about recognizing that for people to thrive, they needed protections for their life. That for people to thrive, they needed to have the right to love and be loved, the right to family life, the right to have free expression. Because from free expression, you learn and gain knowledge, and you mustn't feel the threat of the state and the breath of the police at your neck as you express a view. And that you should be allowed to hear the views of others. And that if you're arrested for a, a, a crime, that you should be brought before courts and put on trial on fair and open evidence. And so together, a formulation from all these people from around the world, a formulation of the values that should inform legal systems was put together. And we have to be the protectors of that because thereby lies our freedom, our liberty, and thereby lies the possibility in the future of hope and the end of, and the end of conflict. And so we've got to be true to this because there are very few universal languages. And as I listen to, to our champion for the, understanding the language of other people, what's in, inherent in all of that is, is our desire to understand the other, to always put your feet into the shoes of the other, and to try to, to, to uh, operate in a just way in all our, our relationships. And that even when people do bad things, because we're all flawed, that there are, of course, there are punishments, criminal punishments in our societies, but you don't deny people their dignity, even if they are people who go to prison. And so I, I just wanted to say, the fire that lives in my life, and I hope lives in the lives of most people, and it doesn't matter whether you're a lawyer or not, this should be something that informs how all of us live our lives, that we're going to respect the other, that we're going to be protective of human rights, that we're going to build societies where they're respected, and that we're going to be champions and ambassadors for it to the world. Thank you.